Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. So Vince Safani is the founder and CEO of Joyride, the world's first micromobility software platform. As an avid cyclist, he started Joyride as a way for cities and entrepreneurs to build sustainable shared mobility systems through turnkey solutions. Vince, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Harry. I'm excited to have you. Uh, you've got a great microphone, which a lot of my guests do not always have. And uh, if anyone's watching on video right now, you've also got the logo perfectly centered behind you on your wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's on my shirt too, but you can't really see it, but there you go. Yeah, I know. That's sort of why I like wearing the hat because I've got the logo right on my hat. You can't really see Good it call. if you wear it on the shirt and I've got a boring blank wall behind me, but uh, I'm excited to chat about Joyride today because it aligns a couple interests uh, that I really have enjoyed over the years. This sort of concept of, I think I call it like owner operators, like, you know, really sort of like building your own business and whether people realize it or not, if you're working in the gig economy, you are an owner operator, you are actually running a business and and then also scooters, right? Um, so I'd love to know sort of uh, how you got started with Joyride and, uh, you know, what, what's the background and what does the company do? Yeah. Um, so Joyride, we're a micro mobility platform, as you mentioned, but we didn't always start off in so software. We actually started mm -hmm. in hardware. And so okay. as a cyclist in downtown Toronto, I was just looking for a way to ride my bike to and from work around the city without fear of getting hit by cars and there weren't, mm -hmm. weren't many bike lanes. And I thought if only there was like, if the city just had better data about where cyclists were riding, cause I could see myself and hundreds of other cyclists commuting every mm -hmm. single day. They just knew where we were riding. They would build better cycling infrastructure. And so I thought there's gotta be a way to collect cycling data. And so mm -hmm. I built this tracking device for my bike. It was really just kind of for myself. And I wasn't, um, I was kind of, I didn't have a lot of money, so and I couldn't afford for a GPS tracker, a fancy GPS tracker. So I, I thought I could use the free public Wi-Fi around the city to track where mm -hmm. my bike was going. Turns out that worked. And mm. so I could track my bike for free. Turns out cool. that the bike sharing system in Toronto and, and a lot of other places around the world, what, we found, what I found out was all the intelligence and all the tracking information only existed in the docking station, not in mm -hmm. the bike itself. And so once a bike left the docking station, the operator, the city didn't know where it went, didn't mm -hmm. know how much it was actually getting used. You knew the timestamp from when yeah. someone took it, brought in it back, that was it. And so the bike sharing companies and bike rental companies started reaching out saying, hey, this is technology that we could actually use for our, our bike sharing systems. Mm -hmm. And so it Joyride really kind of started off as something mm -hmm. for myself, but I thought I could track more information, collect more information about where people are riding, get a more diverse information if we work with bike sharing companies. And so that was the idea. We were going to turn traditional bike sharing into smart bikes. Now there wasn't dockless bike sharing yet in China yeah. that didn't come around. And so as that started to pop up in 2016, I thought eventually this is going to make its way to Europe, North America. This is really exciting. Yeah. And so I found a partner who helped us launch our own kind of dockless bike sharing system in, Lon in London. We called it Travinci. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was illegal. It wasn't, <laughs> we weren't allowed to do it, but I think it was like one of the first official or unofficial dockless bike sharing systems outside cool. of China at the time. Learned a lot, but we had to build the software to power what we we're mm -hmm. doing on the hardware side to track everything, the mobile apps. And uh, it turned out, we weren't the only people thinking of doing something like this and trying to bring yeah. this model from China to other cities around the world. And people heard about what we were doing and started reaching out saying, Hey, we're really interested in using your product. And I got really mm -hmm. excited as an entrepreneur, people want to use the hardware we were building. Right. No, actually it turned out they wanted to use our software. They could get similar hardware from China for a yeah. fraction of the price. And so um, we thought, okay, <laughs> Uh, and so we used our, the platform that we'd built for ourselves um, and uh, decided, okay, this could be kind of like a solution that we help other operators launch their own platform. So we helped mm -hmm. someone launch a, a bike sharing system. One of the first systems we launched was in India. 
uh, 10,000 cool. bikes wow. really early. Um, and then uh, another operator in Canada, another operator in the Middle East using dockless bike sharing. Hmm. Um, and then this like s- small little scrappy company in Santa Monica started putting scooters around hmm. the city. People started calling us saying, hey, there's this company called Bird. Have you heard of them? We want to yeah. do what Bird is doing. Can you help us? And we thought, absolutely not. Scooters are going nowhere. Like mm-hmm. I'm a cyclist. <laughs> Scooters are a toy. This is not a thing. So people just kept asking us. And so we said, okay, if we can find some people who want to run this kind of business, this scooter sharing business, we'll do it. And mm-hmm. so within 24 hours, we had three operators pay us in full, wow. send us scooters and say, Hey, can you help us launch these? So we thought, okay, now we actually have to do it. So we reached out to a company called Segway. Mm-hmm. May it be familiar. Um, yep. We said, hey, we want, we have all these people who want to put these toy scooters out. I said, yeah, we've been hearing about this. So we worked with their engineering team in China, created this custom firmware that operators could essentially hack the scooters with, and deploy them out in the streets. And we launched one of the first scooter sharing systems outside of North America in Europe. Um, and things started to grow since from there. And so before the term micro mobility, hmm. people had been saying that word. We'd kind of consider ourselves a bike sharing platform, which turned into a bike and scooter sharing platform, yeah. which has kind of evolved into, as you know, any sort of like lightweight uh, electric vehicle. Yeah. So what, what's the uh, business look like today as far as the customer profile, big versus small, scooters versus bikes? And maybe there's some other mode I'm not even thinking of that you guys work with. <laughs> Yeah, it's mostly bikes and scooters. I'd say almost all of them. There are a couple operators who are doing some really cool things like uh, with their own custom vehicles. Mm -hmm. They're kind of like a hybrid light electric vehicle in different spaces, but mostly bikes and scooters. Uh, I'd say about a mix of probably half and half of different operators. I think there's a lot more scooters on the platform than bikes, but bikes are still really exciting in a lot of markets and a Mm -hmm. lot of operators, even our scooter sharing operators, are really interested in bikes and, and hmm. transitioning to more of a multimodal fleet. And so I don't think bikes are going anywhere. I think scooters are here to stay. Mm-hmm. It's just like a really exciting space overall, but we have operators well over 30 different countries, uh, well over 150 cities now. Um, and our operators are continuously growing, which is really exciting for the industry. And yeah. I think the environment. Got it. Are most of your customers, I mean, I guess I'm assuming if someone has 10,000, you know, bikes versus, you know, 10 customers with 10 bikes, you know, yeah. how do you think about, you know, the customer profile as far as big and small? Is it, you know, the number of bikes, the number of customers? How do you think about that? Yeah, it's typically the vehicle size um, mm-hmm. is how we segment our operators. But once you start getting into multiple cities, especially multiple countries, then we can consider you as like uh, a you have a lot of growth potential. Some operators are very content. They come to mm-hmm. us and they say, I just want to operate in my one city, my small yeah. 50,000, 100,000 mm-hmm. population city. And that's it. Other people want to be the bird of Europe or mm-hmm. the lime of the Middle East, for example. So yeah. um, we have we have operators with lots of different ambitions. Got it. So if someone's looking to start a scooter share or a bike share um, type company, what uh, what's sort of the sweet spot for Joyride? Because I would imagine, you know, if they get to a certain scale, right, isn't it sort of more effective for them to build it on their own? I mean, like Bird and Lime and all these guys, obviously they're, you know, millions of scooters or bikes, I'm guessing, but, uh, you know, they sort of have their own software. Is there still value that you can provide at that level or where, where do you sort of see your sweet spot? I think of an operator at that, we can help operators at any size. I think the Mm -hmm. value that we bring, especially to a new operator is that we provide the entire software stack, the connectivity with all the vehicles. Mm -hmm. We get you to market a lot faster than you would ever get if you decided to build it all in a house. We've worked with operators with thousands of vehicles who have built their own software stack Mm -hmm. multiple times and have decided to come to us to help them get to market, to get to more markets faster, give them the features that they need, um, reduce their customer support issues. Mm. It is a really challenging business and you got to give it, give credit to some of those companies because they're almost like two different companies, the technology side, which is a huge piece to what you're Mm -hmm. building. And so some, some of these companies like bird and line might say, well, we're a technology first company, or you might want, might think I'm an operations first company. I'm a mobility company first. 
then why not leave the technology, the software part, which is mm. complicated in itself to another partner? Just yeah. in the same way, like you wouldn't necessarily want to build your vehicles. And mm -hmm. even some of these bigger companies still don't build their own vehicles. They still rely on manufacturing. I think none of the partners. big ones build their own vehicles, right? Right. I think <laughs> a lot of them say they do. Yeah. But it's very challenging to build your vehicles, run the operations, build all yeah. the software on top of it. Um, and so you'd be surprised how even some of the biggest companies will uh, hmm. outsource some of the yeah, software good point. components to other players. Yeah, that's a good point. And it's sort of, you know, it's something that I always saw in the rideshare space, you know, okay, Uber and Lyft burst onto the scene, there's all these, you know, copycats, competitors, people want to start their own thing. And I feel like every single time they would go out, they would hire, you know, someone to design the apps. And I'm thinking to myself, like, you know, okay, initially, the technology was really amazing, you know, but now there are people who specialize this and, you know, have built fleet, you know, logistics type software, like Joyride is doing in the bike share and scooter share world. And it was just kind of amazing to me at like, you know, I specifically remember this one point when a bunch of companies launched in Austin, when they all, when Uber and Lyft pulled out and literally they all had their own tech teams. All of their apps were terrible. <laughs> and I was just thinking, <laughs> not terrible, but, you know, relative to Uber and Lyft. And I was just thinking like, man, you know, I'm surprised because there were some people kind of like, you know, we actually had someone on this podcast who, um, George Grama, he kind of did that in the rideshare space. He sold a company in Europe, a rideshare company, and then started licensing out the technology and the app worked pretty damn well. Um, so I'm kind of, uh, I don't know, have you found that most people kind of like looking to go do this on their own? What, what are the reasons why, you know, they might want to build it on their own versus, you know, coming to someone like Joyride? Yeah, they might want to build it on their own if they really want to control every single aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Maybe they want to control every single element in their mobile app. I mm -hmm. mean, even with our customers, you can use our API and still build your mobile app, but maybe there's like special features that you want or maybe there's yeah. specific hardware mm -hmm. that you're also building in-house, like a specific docking station that you just think like, you know what, I need to control this aspect of the business. Mm -hmm. We come across that all the time, which is fine. Got it. Well, so what are, I think a, a good primer too might be, what are the main things it takes to start a scooter share or a bike share company? And I guess, is there a difference too between the two other than the fact that one has scooters and one has bikes? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, there's some key elements that you that you need to be a really good operator. One, you need to be mm -hmm. entrepreneurial. This industry is brand new. The vehicles are new to the space. You have to be able to wear many hats, just like any yeah. sort of entrepreneur in any business. You have to be able to get right in there. Um, you have to be. You have to have a strong operations background. At the end of the day, this could be a, a really big operational play. You need to hire a big team. Potentially, depending on how many vehicles you want, you have to be able to rebalance them. Mm -hmm. You have to have be able to uh, negotiate with the city or the municipality, whoever you're, wherever you're deploying these vehicles. And you can have like a public, uh, public type operation, or you can have right. a private operation as well. So that's a totally different business. Hmm. Um, you have to have cash. This isn't inexpensive to start at the end of the day. Yeah. You have to buy vehicles, bikes, scooters. These things cost money. You have to bring them over from China typically. Um, you have to have some experience in marketing potentially, or at least the willingness to learn. Yeah. Uh, but then really, I think, especially for this type of business, you have to be mission driven. You have to be dedicated to uh, sustainability, the environment, yeah. replacing cars with electric vehicles, because at the end of the day, you need that motivation to get out of bed, to lug these scooters around. That's what yeah. you're going to be doing. Yeah, definitely. No, I think that's actually a good outline. And I will say, you know, the, the more uh, items you brought up, the more I was thinking to myself, man, this sounds like a lot of work. So what are, <laughs> why are all these people, uh, you know, signing up to, um, you know, become customers? Like when you talk to your customers, like what's the, is there, you know, sort of one reason that keeps coming up? I actually like the mission driven part, right? Because I do, you know, I actually was personally like kind of disappointed in the reaction, I guess you would say from cities to, you know, scooters and bikes and people worrying like, oh, what do we do this? scooters are everywhere. They're, they're falling down on the sidewalk. And I'm thinking to myself, just pick them up. You know, I've, I've driven <laughs> on Uber and, you know, firsthand seen like, just, you know, kind of like some of the negative externalities, right. Of all the driving and all that. And I just, you know, I saw scooters, like I literally, I was one of the first bird chargers, you know, here in Santa Monica, I was picking scooters up and dropping them off right outside of um, public transportation, you know, the expo line that we have here in LA. And, you know, I was just thinking to myself, wow, like these are, of course, some people are still joyriding and there's still some issues, but I just saw so much potential. And I 
feel like, um, you know, that has been overlooked a bit. So I'm curious, what is, you know, the, if there is one, one or two main reasons why people are coming to you and what are their reasons for starting a, you know, a scooter or a bike share? We get a lot of people reaching out to us, uh, up to 150 different people a week, reaching out wow. inbound, just saying, Hey, I saw a bird and lime in the city I was traveling in. There's nothing like it in my city. Mm-hmm. I love to bring this. Cause I think it's a really cool way for people to get around. That's kind of like the one, a lot of what we heard after, like at the very beginning of the pandemic, people were saying to us bird and lime or companies like them just left. And now there's nothing here. We'd love to mm-hmm. fill the gap. And so we've had operators mm-hmm. come to us like that as well. who have brought a local voice to the transportation scene mm-hmm. because maybe they felt like they could better support um, yeah. or provide a solution to their city. Got it. Yeah, no, I think that it's funny that you mentioned that because I feel like over the years, you know, especially I've heard a lot, I've had a lot of people reach out to me on the rideshare side for the same reasons, you know, Uber and Lyft aren't here yet. You know, we tried to get them to come to us, you know, and obviously the companies, you know, Uber, Lyft, or they've got their own initiatives that they're worrying about. So it is kind of, I, I like that kind of local flavor. So um, let's talk about Joyride and what they help with. You mentioned all of those things that it takes to start a scooter bike share company. What do you guys specifically help with, you know, if I'm someone, let's say I'm in a local small town, small area, you know, just, I think there's an opportunity for, uh, let's say scooter share. And I come to Joyride. What are the main things that you guys help with? Yeah. So we'll give you all the software you need to run and manage your fleet. We'll provide you the white label mobile app. So you get the Android app, the iOS app in your brand. You also get a dashboard cool. to manage your fleet. We handle all the payments for you, help you with all the payments all the promos and marketing that you want to do as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Live tracking of all your vehicles. If you need to do things like ID verification, we can do that as well. We also can provide an operations app to help you and your maintenance team um, track all the vehicles, manage support tickets, uh, uh, manage any maintenance on the vehicles as well. So we help you with that. We also have partners in the industry that can help with all uh, your vehicle choices. So we work Mm -hmm. with all the best vehicle manufacturers in the space. So if you're looking for bikes, bike locks, GPS tracking devices, Mm. scooters, we can help you with that. We'll partner, uh, we'll connect you with all the best people and try and get you the best pricing as well. On the insurance side, we have partners in the insurance space, which is very complicated and it's new, especially in micro mobility (laughs) um, and getting really good plans. I'm sure you know a lot about this as well. So We've talked, we've done a lot of podcasts on insurance. Let's put it that way. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's really complicated. We have really good partners in the space that can either help with consulting, help you with research. So if you don't know anything about, you know, what are the requirements in my city, we can help you out with that. Uh, If there's RFP writing, we have a Hmm. service to help you with writing an RFP to actually get permit in the city. Um, We've helped companies with branding as well. So if you need a website, if you need a logo, we have, we have branding and design services as well. We have partners on the operations side. So if you want to do operations as a service and totally yeah. outsource all your ops, you can do that too. I and mean, we have some entrepreneurs, I don't recommend it. We have some entrepreneurs that will manage their fleet in their bed from their phone, mm-hmm. their fleet on the other side of the country. Yeah. I don't know how, I don't know how they do it, but I, they've told me they've done it. So um, it's entirely possible to kind of, outsource a lot of the different yeah. components to running this business. It's just as much as depends on how much you want to get your hands dirty. Yeah. So it sounds like sort of, you know, if I'm an entrepreneur coming to Joyride, kind of the main things that I'm going to need, um, you know, I guess sort of an idea and a little grit, you know, kind of like you mentioned, but uh, then as far as, you know, physical things that I would need is like kind of manpower, right? Like either on the operations and running the business side, but also, you know, the sort of rebalancing and, you know, getting the scooters out there and fixing them and bikes and things like that, the sort of like in the field type operations um, and then money too, right? I guess, I guess cash and or financing, I guess I'm assuming, you know, the financing is going to be tough, the smaller you are, uh, are those sort of the two main things that I would need to bring to the table as an entrepreneur? Yeah. F- financing, um, which is, uh, can always be a challenge depend no matter how small you are, or how big you yeah. are. Um, financing is always a challenge. We do have some partners on the financing space that we've started working with that can potentially help you depending on the type of like where you want to launch and the type of business you want to launch. So yeah. we have partners in that space as well. Um, and then, yeah, grit. You need definitely need a lot of grit. This isn't 
it's not an easy thing where you can yeah. necessarily lay in your bed and, and, and run this type of business, but mm-hmm. um, you have to be able to get your hands dirty. Yeah. So are there any successful qualities or metrics that you've observed from the most successful operators? Maybe there's, you know, certain regions or, you know, lack of competition, or, you know, like you said, just someone who works their ass off, like what are the one or two things you think that have led to like the operators that you work with having the most success? And also, you know, not to make this too long of a question, but how do you define success? Is this a business you're going to get rich off of, or is it just something to pay the bills? Uh, What do you think? Yeah, I mean, our, you can make you can definitely make money in this mm-hmm. business. Um, this isn't uh, this is a, a business that you can definitely be profitable in the first year on. We have lots of operators mm-hmm. who are profitable. I've had you know, not not too long ago, I had an operator just call me out of the blue and say, "Hey, in the first, we pay back all our vehicles in the first six weeks." Mm-hmm. Um, so it's definitely possible. I think one of the I mean, lack of competition certainly helps. If you're mm-hmm. the only operator in your market, that, I mean, that that's such a that's such a a huge head start. So that uh, shouldn't go unsaid. Um, mm-hmm. Other metrics I would say are really good operational teams and operationally sound teams. Um, if you're trying to do this alone as a solo entrepreneur, it's not. I mean, it'll be harder for sure, just like in any business. Mm-hmm. But if you're able to surround yourself with a good ops team, have everyone kind of pitch in and, and play their part, then you'll do really well. Um, those are kind of like the key factors I would say are, um, are will define successful teams. And if you're patient too, and if you're not mm-hmm. trying to grow really quickly, like we have some, some of our best operators ha- are in two or three markets and they mm-hmm work their asses off in those markets every single season. Yeah. They grind it out. They have such a loyal customer base um, and not trying to like nickel and dime all your riders, keeping prices fair, having a really good brand, um, having that local voice, being that local option are all kind of metrics yeah. I would say to be successful. Another thing too, I should mention is some of our operators come to us and they say, you know, I, uh, I have an in with the city or I know mm-hmm. some city official or some politician that helps, you know, that, I yeah. mean, that, that will it's, always help. It's funny you mentioned that, right? Because obviously what we've seen in the micro mobility space is that, you know, you mentioned RFPs and you know, licensing, right? This has been a huge aspect. You know, the public policy side has become a huge aspect of running a successful scooter and bike share business. And I feel like, you know, especially in a lot of these, you know, more local areas, you know, you see like, you know, the guy who owns the car dealership or the woman who, you know, is connected to everyone in the area, right? Like, I feel like those are, there are probably some unique opportunities, you know, if you're someone, you know, kind of like that ultra networker, you know, maybe not like Los Angeles with 20, 30 million people, but, you know, in smaller to medium sized cities, I think there's some cool opportunities where you can leverage your relationships. You know, maybe the city was on the fence about bringing, you know, a scooter company there, but if you're, you know, a trusted voice in the community and you come to them and you're like, I'm going to run it, I'm going to do it my way. You know, you might uh, have a lot more uh, pull with them. So I think that's a good example. What about things you can't control? Like, you know, weather or, you know, maybe even density of the city, you know, whether it's like really packed, you know, like a, you know, ur- urban, uh, um, you know, metro area or somewhere that's a lot more spread out? Yeah, I think there's some studies that will show that to be kind of like a successful, and, the, and a lot of these studies are more around like bike sharing, but they'll mm-hmm. say like you need like 1,500 people per square kilometer. Hmm. Sorry, I don't know what that is in miles, but, uh, or a city with at least a minimum population size of 50,000 to be mm-hmm. able to deploy a couple hundred vehicles successfully. Those are kind of like the traditional metrics, I would say. Got it. And so if you're in a city like that, I mean, we have some operators who are in cities smaller than 50,000, for sure. But look, there are over 10,000 cities around the world that mm-hmm. have at least 50,000 people in it. So yeah. if you're in one of those 10,000 mm-hmm. cities, you're a potential... <laughs> That's a good stat to pull out, <laughs> I mean, I mean, look, I mean, Bird and Lime are in... 100 cities, maybe 200, I think they'll mention that's, there's a huge opportunity all around the world to be able to deploy a kind of system like this. 
Yeah. So, I mean, talking about Bird and Lime, we mentioned them a couple of times. Obviously, they're the bigger, you know, if not biggest, you know, scooter operators, especially in the U.S. And I know there's a bunch, you know, around the world now. One thing this does kind of remind me of is the the recent switch that Bird made. They used to, you know, I used to be an independent contractor for Bird charging scooters, you know, getting up at 5 a.m. Yeah. Huge pain in the ass. I hated it. Um, and dropping off the scooters. And they've switched this fleet manager program. I don't know how familiar you are with that, but it's sort of, you know, I, I haven't done it myself, but it kind Kind of remind like some of what you're describing kind of reminds me obviously bird is you know still sort of running this and you're running it under there that umbrella or brand are you familiar with that program and how do you see it you know i guess comparing to a joyride uh, if at all yeah great question um i don't know what i know about it is from the bird operators who come to us very often mm-hmm. and try and find out how they can transition to joyride and not mm-hmm. be a bird operator I, like the way they're a bird I, fleet manager and yeah, they're bird fleet manager working for joyride. Yeah. Not, wor- not working for joyride right. and launching Sorry. their own business. Yeah. 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 But you know, yeah. And the way I kind of think about it is like almost like the Shopify and Amazon analogy. Like, do I want to mm-hmm. run my business through Amazon, mm. potentially have Amazon compete with me one day? Yeah. Do I want to launch totally on my own brand, have that voice and relationship with all my customers don't have to worry about joyride coming in, telling yeah. me when to work, how many vehicles I'm allowed to deploy, if I have to work on holidays, and then also giving them a cut of my revenue when I'm doing really well mm-hmm. and overperforming. Um, it's such a, I think, a more exciting offering, especially for people who think of themselves as entrepreneurs. Like yeah. you want to run your own business. You want to launch your own brand. You don't want to work for someone maybe maybe bird will let you put your own logo on the vehicles. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't see that as much of an option anymore, but people want to launch their own business. And so we give them an option to do that. Yeah, no, I think that's a good analogy. This sort of, you know, I mean, obviously this is a challenge I think we're seeing in many different tech industries right now, whether it's, you know, Amazon, right? You, if you're a mom and pop business, you list on Amazon, you now have access to billions of people, I'm guessing, mm-hmm. but you know, they do take their cut. You got to send it to them, right? I'm sure the margins are, you know, you, you don't have as good a margins, right? Versus going direct, but going direct has its own problems or, you know, opportunities, I guess you would say itself. I guess yeah. I'm, I, I can imagine which side of the, the fence you lie on. So <laughs> totally, totally makes yeah. sense. But I guess, it, you know, one thing, um, you know, because one thing that I like about the gig economy, you know, if we're talking like, you know, independent chargers, you know, back in the day for bird, for example, is that there was no risk that you could sign up, you could get started, you could be making money, and you're sort of like an entrepreneur, whether you realize it or not. Um, and there is maybe limited upside versus, you know, kind of going out and being an entrepreneur on your own, and or you have you know, more risk, but, you know, unlimited upside, but it does seem like, you know, the fleet manager, it might be, you know, a way to dip your toes. And, you know, then it sounds like people might even be coming uh, to you after. So I just think these, these different models are interesting. I'm curious if you have any take as far as, you know, like what is, you know, bird uses these fleet managers, Lime, I think still uses, you know, kind of more the independent contractor model. What do you think as far as like servicing these vehicles, right? Because on the employee side of the company, right? Like operations and things like that. You obviously need people very vested, but it's like, it's a different job than, you know, like frontline repairing vehicles and rebalancing and things like that. Do you have any thoughts one way or the other there? So we have one customer um, called uh, Ride Goat. And mm-hmm. so Goat is kind of has a very similar model to this bird fleet manager model. Goat has been, they've been around longer than the bird fleet manager model, but say you're, you want to launch with Joyride but you don't want to commit to a lot of vehicles. Maybe you just want to test the water a little bit. You can actually go to GOAT, launch under the GOAT brand, any city you want, get the vehicles from them. They also have many different vehicle options. So you don't have to buy the most expensive vehicle. You can buy different, different kinds of vehicles, bikes, scooters, try it out in your market, potentially Mm -hmm. even grow with GOAT if you want using the GOAT brand. Um, and then if you want to transition to Joyride, you can do that too. Or if you want to continue to grow with Goat because they have a really good model and you feel uh, valued and, and yeah. you're not told when to work, how many vehicles to put out, it's totally under your control, um, then you can continue to grow with them. And so we have, we've seen a ton of growth with Goat. Goat has lots of, of these smaller fleet managers all over the United hmm. States. who are launching these smaller fleets pretty much anywhere they want with all the support from goat, all the team, Mm. plus you get all the software. Um, and you don't have to like 
argue with vehicle manufacturers and yeah. worry about all that kind of stuff. And so you get all your vehicles really used. To Interesting. Too. So you're sort of like a sub customer of uh, Joyride, but through Goat in this uh, scenario. Yeah, exactly. What what's the? It's G O A T. Yes. Okay, cool. We'll leave a link to that in the show notes. Um, interesting. Um, so are there any other operators? You talked about Goat and some of the others. Are there any other operators um, that you feel, you know, are kind of doing something pretty cool that are working with you or interesting or unique or any just ones that you want to highlight? I'm sure they all feel like your babies, but uh, uh, this is the <laughs> opportunity now if you've got any favorites. <laughs> I don't have favorites. But there's I know, always. I, know, I was just putting the pressure on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's always operators that are doing something cool. Um, we have an operator in um, Connecticut uh, called Lynx, Lynx City, who's experimenting with a lot of different models. They have the public model. They've been in different cities around the United States. One thing that they're doing is not just your traditional rental. We can do long, long-term rentals too. So hmm. if you want to take the vehicle and hold on to it as a user, maybe you maybe because of COVID, you don't want to be sharing vehicles or, or something yeah. like that. You, you might be concerned. You want your own personal vehicle, but you don't want to shell out a thousand, fifteen hundred bucks to go buy your own scooter. You can do a lease model with links, for example. And so that's a possibility cool. too. Yeah. There's lots of, I mean, lots of really interesting operators. I think another one is um, uh, they've, they, they work with uh, like amusement parks. And so you can actually ride different animals yeah. around. It's very interesting. It's, <laughs> I think it's very interesting, uh, called rideables, uh, huh. totally different, different space, but also like lightweight electric vehicles, really creative entrepreneurs, but kind so of the vehicles are need. like animals. They're like, uh, they're, they're dressed up like animals. Yeah. They're ah. designed. So imagine like a, a sit down scooter that looks like a giraffe like, or something that looks like a giraffe. Yeah. Huh. Share a link with that's you. pretty cool. Right. You know, you mentioned the private use case, and I think this is something that's really interesting. And I feel like is a huge untapped, um, you know, sort of market or potential. And, you know, I've seen companies like Bird, you know, sort of tout the, you know, kind of, hey, if you put a scooter dock, you know, out in front, right? Like people are now parking in front of your business and they get out and they look at 7-Eleven and they might want to spend money there. It's kind of obvious, but, um, <laughs> you know, I think that that use case makes a lot of sense. And I think there's a lot of opportunity, especially on like these smaller to medium size um, fleets in the private side. I'm curious if you have any comments or feedback. One example that comes to mind is a lot of hotels now are starting to rent e-bikes, for example, for their guests, you know, to take out and about. And it could be, you know, they're all like, you know, go somewhere, you know, check it out, register by Imagine if that whole process was digital and, you know, kind of using more of a fleet application. I don't know if you've seen any cool, um, you know, opportunity there, but what, what do you think about the opportunity on the private side and how does that compare versus, you know, more of like a public, you know, B2C, you know, kind of scooter share type model? Yeah, about a third of our operators are either just in the private space or mm. they're, or they've expanded into the private space. And we have more and more operators who are really interested in that place because they don't have to get a permit from the city necessarily. Right. And so we have if you're just of operating yeah. on your grounds. Exactly. And so we have one in New York who works with bodegas. We have some, uh, many in Europe who work with different hotels, different mm -hmm. tourist areas, and they have their vehicles out there. Maybe it's on a resort or, or they're yeah. just in hotels. We have some operators who just focus on um, like apartment buildings, co-working spaces. They work mm. with property developers to put these yeah. vehicles in and docking stations in as an amenity. Yeah. Um, lots of different business opportunities. Some mm. just focus on the campus space. And so their market is really niche, but they it's a huge market opportunity. Yeah. They could go around to campuses all across the United States and offer this as a solution. Yeah. Yeah. That is cool. Um, very cool. Yeah. No, I think that private, uh, you know, space, I, I appreciate you sharing all those examples. So, um, I, I want to ask you about what's next for Joyride, but I thought of one more question along these sure. lines. I'm curious for all of these companies, you know, like, okay, I think it's pretty clear by now that this isn't, um, you know, the easiest of businesses, right. Running scooter or bike share. It's tough. It's challenging. There's some big rewards running this as an entrepreneur. Uh, what's the community like for these folks? I'm sure that Joyride is doing stuff, but are, you know, are there people out there that are sharing information or, you know, are there resources out there beyond what you guys are providing, but what's that look like for people that are doing this? Yeah, it's a really great community. Uh, we're starting to build and uh, get our operators together more. I know there's like mm -hmm. a micro mobility conference that's happening in September 
in yeah. California. So I'll really be speaking excited. at it. <laughs> oh, you will? Fantastic. Yeah. Well, I'll be there and I'm sure there. I'll see you guys there. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the community is still in some ways small, but it's also yeah. like really big because we have people from all over the world who are deploying these kinds of businesses. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's really exciting. And there's the micro mobility conference yeah. in the United States and one in Europe every year. Um, so we get to meet a lot of different players. And there's mm -hmm. also what we're finding a lot of new startups who are coming into the space offering like really niche so solutions dedicated mm -hmm. just to micro mobility. Maybe it's in docking stations, mm -hmm. maybe it's an ID verification, maybe it's in routing, maybe yeah. it's in some sort of mass application, maybe it's just like the tracking on the scooter or like a special headlight for a scooter. It's just like, yeah. it's a really exciting time to be in this industry. And it's the very, very beginning of micro mobility, even still, yeah. it's not, it's not, hasn't matured in any way. I don't think. Yeah. Well, I feel like there's even like a more niche or narrowed down, like interesting community opportunity, or, you know, like kind of building the rideshare guy of, you know, basically someone yeah. who wants to be a fleet manager, right. Uh, you know, and run, you know, a fleet owner and run their own scooters, you know, through Joyride. Um, because, you know, this is like, I feel like we see this actually a lot in the fleet owner space with vehicles, right. People that are renting them out to Uber and Lyft drivers, or other, you know, shared on Turo, right? Like there's a lot of people that are basically running fleets of vehicles, whether they're cars or scooters or bikes, but there isn't a lot of, I feel like public information out there. Like it's hard to like Google, how do I be a successful, yeah. you know, scooter share fleet owner operator? Like what do I even Google in the first place? So I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of like putting it out there. Cause I feel like someone listening or watching right now could kind of run with this. Um, but I'm curious if there's anything like kind of specific, you know, if there's someone like kind of talking about this or, you know, providing best practices or anything in you know, sort of more like a public forum or, you know, anything like that, that you've seen? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's things that we're building right now. I think what you have with ride sharing is such a fantastic model for the micro mobility industry. Part of one of the reasons why we were fundraising is so mm -hmm. we can build out more of this community and build out mm -hmm. those on demand tools, courses, yeah. uh, show people just how, um, launch this type of uh, business because there aren't many resources out there like you were saying so that that is something that we are working on actively something that i was working yeah. on right before this call or right <laughs> before this podcast but uh so yeah it's something that we're investing in for sure very cool. Yeah. And you did mention that you guys raised a recent round, I think it was 3.7 million. So congrats yeah. on that. Um, what are the other plans uh, with that, that money? And you know, what's next uh, for, for Joyride? What should we look for and keep an eye out in the years to come? Yeah. I th so our goal, I mentioned 10,000 cities, and we believe that we can help hmm. operators get into 10,000 cities around the world. And so maybe once we hit cool. 10,000, we'll stop. And I can promise here live on the podcast that we'll stop at 10,000, but uh, uh, we're not quite there yet, but we're working on building a platform that encompasses not just the software, but every component. So mm -hmm. like I said, helping with hardware, helping with insurance, helping with financing, helping with branding, really um, uh, trying to be, I think Shopify is like a really good model. Yeah. And so we, we'd love to be like the Shopify of the micro mobility space. Mm -hmm. You're in what, a couple hundred cities right now? Is that what you said? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So what do you think is going to take, you know, what was it going to take to kind of get you from that couple hundred to 10,000? Because that is a big jump. It's a good ambitious goal. I think I would be pretty happy to stop if I got to 10,000 too, if I were you. Um, but what do you think it's going to take yeah, to my kind wife of get there? would want me to stop, I think, at that <laughs> point. <laughs> uh, I think, so there's, there's some key elements that will always kind of prevent people from launching until we solve them. Mm -hmm. um, and make it really easy, like turnkey, yeah. we're not going to get to 10,000. So I mentioned insurance. There's no like easy out of the box, affordable. And I Got actually it. mean affordable way to get insurance. Like if you're, mm -hmm. you have, I just saw a quote today. One came in, one of our operators, 20 vehicles, they have to pay. I don't know if I'm not saying who it is or whatever. So yeah, 60, 70,000 insurance. <laughs> Yeah. Right for twenty vehicles, I think like that's how more than it would be for a car. Usually, a car is about five thousand dollars a year. <laughs> but, how, but how can you? But how is that sustainable? How can you actually yeah. become profitable? So we're trying to find ways, actively trying to find ways, and partner with groups that can provide reasonable insurance rates for our operators. Right. That's that's one. That's always going to be a barrier. Um, hardware has to be not only um, affordable, but right now what we're finding is a huge backlog. 
right. people can't people can't get vehicles. We have operators who purchased vehicles three, yeah. four months ago, and they're still waiting another three, four months before they actually arrive. Yeah. So once that um, supply hopefully chain that's sort of up, more of a temporary supply chain. That's issue, a temporary yeah. thing. More manufacturers coming up. Uh, we're seeing some newer manufacturers coming out with some really exciting things, new business models, making it really easy for anyone to deploy and launch in multiple cities, multiple countries with multiple currencies, different mm. rules. So that's always kind of been a barrier, but now we have some companies doing that. Um, and then the third part is really the industry know-how. How do you how do you even launch a, a scooter sharing business? How do yeah. you know? How do I get vehicles? What do I do with them? How do I repair them? How do I change the brake cables? What happens if my IOT dies? What if they lose connectivity? Like what, what do I do? And so part of what you were talking about is how yeah. do, who's building those resources? That's what we're trying to do. We think those resources can help elevate and, and, and help our customers expand and grow a lot faster. Yeah. And over yeah, no, time, think- cities becoming more accepting of scooter sharing yeah. too and bike sharing the industry know-how definitely i mean i think that's probably maybe that's because of what i do that's sort of the most appealing or interesting to me <laughs> but um yeah it definitely seems like i feel like with a lot of stuff like this that you know if more people knew about it right and if there was more data if there was more you know videos if there was more training if there's more people buzz right then uh, it would open up a lot of two opportunities so uh well i really appreciate you coming on vince i think what you guys are doing is very exciting and hopefully uh, you'll get at least a few if not more uh, people reaching out to you and Joyride about starting their own scooter or bike share company. If folks want to learn more about Joyride and you know follow you and what you guys are up to, where should they go? www.joyride.city. Perfect. Cool. We'll leave a link to that in the show notes. Really appreciate it. Take care, Vince. Thanks, Harry. Bye.